Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the chairman and founder of DNA Behaviour International. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another identity conversation. And I have the great pleasure to uh, have with me Andre Brisson. And Andre's up there in Canada, so he's getting a little colder for him for uh, ready bunkering down for the winter. And Andre is the impulsive thinker and runs a podcast uh, around that. I, I had the great fortune to be on it a few weeks ago, and it was a tremendous conversation about identity and knowing yourself and the power of it and, you know, all the dimensions of human behavior that 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 one needs to know as a CEO uh, in, in running your company. Um, and also he has a company, Tactical Breakthroughs, where he does a lot of work in uh, coaching people, helping them get out of their own way, uh, solving complex problems. So welcome, Andre. Thank you, Hugh. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so Andre, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your life and career background and how you got to become an, an engineer and, uh, you know, some of the things that you've done and, you know, we'll go from there. Well, for me... Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a recovered engineer, as I like to call myself. Um, and yeah, I went, was raised that I was going to be an engineer. And that's what I did. I got into a small company where we just dealt with a lot of unique things with various equipment. Um, basically, we did a lot of repairs, we were told we can never be done. And uh, just just kept the ball rolling. I became a partner there found out that they didn't want to grow. They were happy where they were. So I created my first engineering company called Jade Engineers, which is an acronym for just another damn engineer. Um, and there was just, uh, basically I was told I can't build an engineering company based on niche markets that requires unique learning and it's not from a book. So I said, okay, I'm going to do that and prove to you and did. Uh, unfortunately, undiagnosed ADHD, made me lose that company with a bad partnership that I knew was bad and then restructured objective engineering where we engineer simplicity objectively uh, with some of my old teammates and um, started that and then with that um, with my severe ADHD diagnosis and mild autism about six seven years back I developed I started I decided to create tactical breakthroughs and you know I'm the impulsive thinker. It's kind of like what I've been known for. And I'm out here to help people understand themselves better and get to true understand and validation and get a vocabulary of themselves to be able to communicate their differences and uniqueness. Um, because it's something I've been looking at for the last 25 years about myself. So it's not just a recent thing I've been looking into is for a while I was trying to find these strengths of mine, quote unquote, but I was actually finding out what was not normal and trying to, to fix my, my non-uniqueness. But now that I understand what I know now, I want everyone to have the right uniqueness, their uniqueness, the right vocabulary so they can communicate it because the world's just not there accepting differences. Yeah, that's a, it's a big thing for the world to, uh, you know, to understand, accept and respect differences. That's, that's the sort of the key. Or value them. I think people yeah. respect them, but they don't value them. And that's what I want people to understand. Let's value our differences and then we'll all get along. Yeah, and certainly teams need need differences just mm -hmm. to be interacting with people, just to see, to understand more about who they are and, and accept, okay, that's the way they live because that's who they are. Mm -hmm. That's great. Let them celebrate it and 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 celebrate it yourself. And and I suppose it's a difficult thing coming from the engineering background that's so structured, you know, I, I've often said to people, because I was an accountant originally, I'm a reformed accountant, and you use the term that you're a recovered engineer. Yeah, very traditionalist uh, professions, right? Like my accounting buddy actually told me this joke in the sense of an accountant, but it's applicable to engineer, if not most professions, is why did the engineer cross the road there? Because that's what they did last year. Yeah, and that that would be that that would be I think the same for 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 a, for a lot of accountants. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's what I throw a lot of people off is just because the all problems are similar but not the same, and I always had a different attack to it because the real cause of the problem was never the same. Maybe the symptoms, the the outlooking, 
result is the same, but really the stuff that happens at the core of the problem was always unique and different. And that's all what I went to. And I think that was really sort of going to play into my into my uh, to my question in 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 a sense, though, that engineers are needed to 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 solve uh, like architects and like accountants are needed to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And it does need creativity to do that. Depending on what type of problem, if it's the standard problem that's re it's repeatable, well, it depends on your definition of creativity. I know a lot of engineers are creative by repeating the same solutions over and over. I think there's a creativity to that. But a lot of what I do is the creativity part is it's very unique and different every time. Yeah. Um, and then for me, especially in the construction site, that's where I've got to be known reputation wise is I can solve real problems. And a lot of the conceptual engineers, design engineers have that challenge. I'm not saying they're incompetent or they don't know what they're doing is on paper, they're really good at designing. I don't like designing because it's repetitive, but they're great at that. But if something's not fitting on site, I can go in there within half an hour, an hour, work with the trades and everyone involved and come up with a solution and make it work on paper. While a lot of the conceptual engineers, they, they have a challenge working with the real versus the conceptual just like a lot of the trades can't work conceptually, but they're really good with their hands and the real solutions. Yeah, I, I think I can see that, that designing is a process, but it's a question of somebody's actually got to see the real problem or come up with a unique solution yeah. first before it starts to get designed into a process. And that's really where it would seem your unique uh, edge is. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's something else you also talk about as well as making, you know, prop simplifying problems and simplifying complexity. <laughs> yeah. And in the engineering world, they really like to make things complex for no reason, in my opinion. Yeah. So simplifying complex problems really throws off a lot of engineers because so a lot of times I think it's just the industry and the way I think society rose them up. Like to be an engineer always has to be a complex problem. But for me, it always comes down to a simple problem and it can't be done. And that's usually my, that's been my biggest arguments with other engineers. It says it can't be that simple. And usually I say, yeah, I can be because I just did it. It is a simple problem. And let's fix this. I, I found most of the time these things sit under your nose. Um, yeah. You know, that, 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 that but people aren't, people aren't looking there or, or choose not to look there. Um, well, I, yeah, I think there's two things to that. Either they choose not to look. Now, that's I think that's an ego problem and arrogance. But I think a lot of times, too, they don't see it. I think because it, it's just in their wiring. Because a lot of times I can go in a project or a scenario where they've been looking at a problem for months or weeks, and I show up five minutes later, with boom, 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 it's here and here. Right. It's, that's clear to me, but to a lot of other people, it's just not. So I think there's a bit of difference on how, I guess they solve problems or they see problems. Or sometimes when you're staring at a problem for so long, your 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 brain plays tricks on you. But how much do you think it's also your uniqueness as a human? Uh, you know, I know from your, you know, for example, from your DNA uh, discovery reports that you did, uh, you know, and for our, our listeners, you know, Andre is an influencer style, but very importantly, you're extremely rational and creative yeah. and, and you know you're on the edges right on the edges there with with those in terms of strength and so how much do you think it's just your innate wiring and that unique gift that you've got inside you that enables you to do this oh, and it's, communicate it it's completely my innate ability i don't even know how i can process the information usually I end up finding the solution and then work it out later but it's almost like a gut instinct or an intuition yeah um but usually what I, I kind of find it, because I've been trying to put language around this lately, and usually when I'm talking to people or I'm qu asking questions, I'm always looking for what's missing, not looking for what's wrong. Yeah. Um, I remember a, a hunter used to tell me, he told me this once, he goes, when I go hunting, I don't look for a moose. I look for a stump with ears or... I look for different things that don't belong. And ever since then, I started think, looking for what doesn't belong. I was starting to pick up animals 
in in the in the bush, right? And I think I always did that with my engineering problem solving. I just always look for something that don't that doesn't belong and look more into that, and seem to work out very well. And in a way, it's a different approach to pattern rec recognition in some ways. Um, yeah, I'm looking for missing patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's in, it's it's interesting because I've just I've just myself been doing a, this focused thinking ex, uh, coaching and training to help me you know zero in on things. I'm pretty good at it, but in a way, a lot of it involves pattern recognition or looking for yeah what's, what's odd sitting there. Because um, sometimes I think the other part of it is people might see the odd the odd thing sitting there. They don't want to confront it. Um, yes. Or, or they think that everything else is looks normal enough, so let's not worry about that, because it's not going it's it's not going to interrupt the flow. Whereas actually, it is the the outlier. Um, well, I think they're hoping it won't interrupt the flow. In the engineering world, that's usually what happens. Instead of owning up to a mistake or a possible possible error, they'll hope it can get buried or not be brought to light. And then usually by then the project is so out of whack, you can't go back to find out exactly where that started, but their ego is saved, but the client in the end gets messed up. Right. And I think part of what we're talking about here is confronting, is is, is con being prepared to confront the truth. And yeah. you know, I, th I think that, you know, from what I can see, there's no shortage of uh, capacity for, from you to, to, no. you know, to want to do that, to see it and actually just lay it out on the table and say, guys, this is it. Um, and you need to deal with it, essentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I do that very well without looking for blame. I can yeah. go in any group. I don't care whose fault it is. I don't care how we got here. I need to solve this problem now for the client. And let's just be open and honest and get right to it. I guess yeah, I never understood. I never until we talked about this and understand what that was a confrontational type of thing, but I can be confrontational, but in a very diplomatic or strategic way. Right. And I think, you know, me sort of saying that doesn't mean that you have to be rude about it. I think you mm -hmm. can uh, say it nicely, as you say, without blame or without emotion, yeah. uh, but it's, it, it's going to be left said there and, and should be heard um, or would be heard. And I think it's interesting that you called, the engineering company objective engineering because to me this is all about objective thinking well it's also an oxymoron just like i'm in an entrepreneurial engineering firm which is also another oxymoron <laughs> well in some ways yes you know but i think there's a degree of you that wants to shake up engineering as yeah, well. i want to change how engineering is done in the field for sure yeah and 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 there's and there's there's room. I think there's room to do that. Um, yeah. And it seems that you do. You you know you can do that. I think through just coming with the the type of thinking that you have. But also, you know, I've sort of picked up is your passion around human behavior, mm -hmm. and wanting to understand all the drivers of people. You know, you you've. Okay, you've completed the DNA discovery, but I know you use Strengths Finder, Colby, which is good. They're all bringing different uh, um, parts of the recipe, if you want to call it that, or looking yeah. at at people from different dimensions. Yeah, that's that's all helpful. Uh, well, to... I've always been a student of behavior since I was a little kid. Actually, I was always curious how and why people reacted a certain way if the same information was provided to them from different people or different environments or different conditions. So I've been studying this a long, long time from a, I would, I, you know what, my probably five or six years old. Yeah. So in an informal way, you were just, you were, you were, you were working on it. Yeah. And, and why do you think that it's interesting because I worked on it for a long time informally. I realized when I looked at my journal before I actually got into the business, but you know, but one day I was so moved by some things I saw and how people dealt with money. I realized I had to be in it and I wouldn't be fulfilled. But do you think there's something about your childhood or background that got you looking at human behavior? 100%. Yeah. It's the dysfunctional environment I was raised in, surrounded by. And I know I've got this innate belief and principle system of fairness and justice 
um, that it never made sense to me. Therefore, I inquired more and observed. And do you think it's also your ADHD in there and sort of feeling like, and you mentioned autism at one point, just just you being different as a human got you to inquire it. Maybe people isolated you at times and you didn't know how to fit in. Yeah, um, you, that, that definitely had an, uh, an aspect of it. Um, and fortunately, I was not a fawner. I was a fighter. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> with that, this, that, that, uh, yeah, very confrontational, right? Um, yeah, something wasn't right. It wasn't fair. Therefore, I will question and ask. And the thing that frustrated most people was I did it in the way that it was not rude or inconsiderate. Like a lot of teachers always had problems. Like I remember my principal telling my kids in grade school is it's a hard, it's very hard to give them discipline or trouble when he has valid reasons every time he challenged a teacher. Yeah. It's not like he was just being disruptive or disrespectful. It was always logical reasoning and always in pursuit of understanding why you had more better rights or more right to lie or manipulate people. Like I even had challenges with my priest and when I was a kid. So yeah, I would think the HD definitely kind of aggravated which created my more interest on why, uh, but also wasn't just me. It was the whole family unit that was dysfunctional. Yeah. And then my autism side, I was just told by someone, which makes a lot of sense to me, that actually was, that's one of my abilities to be able to pull out the emotions out and be completely rational, which is also misleading to people. Just, I, it's not that I don't care, I don't have any feelings about it. It's just I can pull that out and get to a rational decision because this is rationally, logically is what we should do. And just because I'm not showing, you know, sugar coating or, you know, feel, you know, giving a two hour speech about why we should look at this differently. It's just boom. Here we go. Boom, boom, boom. No emotion. Or if I recognize the emotion in it, I can pull it out. And I think that, to be honest, I think that's a gift that you have, not only for spotting the uh the the abnormality in a in a in a problem or in a pattern mm -hmm. for the engineering type business but i think also it's 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 some, it's a gift you have for the work you're doing if i understand it with tactical breakthroughs yeah uh, to to help somebody else see what the real problem is that they're dealing with and and get them to uh you know to confront it um right yeah, you're right. I do do that. I get people to confront the actual challenge and to work through it. If they don't want to, then I'm sorry. I'm not the person for it. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, this is this is sort of it's there's some interesting dimensions there because I, I suppose the one I want to bring up is you use the term impulsive thinker. But are you really the impulsive thinker? Oh, interesting. What do you mean by that? Well, it seems to me that you're able to, you know, intuitively, instinctively spot problems, uh, mm -hmm. come up with a solution. And, and you know, in, in, in that sense, creativity, you've got a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. But do you just go and, but is that impulsive? Do you go and do off the map things at a, at a drop of a hat with that is that what makes you impulsive uh are you are you doing daredevil things out there that just uh completely well it depends, well, it depends on uh, who you talk to but yeah in the engineering world definitely i'm doing cliff jumping stuff but actually the the, the term impulsive thinker it's I've always been very thoughtful. I always thought about my thinking. I was also always reflective. But when I do that in my head, nothing makes sense. So when I talk to people or I talk out loud, then all these things connect impulsively. And people are actually saying, like, so as I'm talking to clients, or I'm talking to people and I'm just hearing what they're saying. Then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. And then something will shoot out of my mouth. I didn't put any thinking into it. It's an impulsive reaction that connects everyone's dots. So that's what the impulsive thinker is about. If I can talk my way, if I can have me talk it out or listen to people, 
impulsively everything make connections based on my thinking. So that's why I always need someone else with me to get the impulsive thinking happening. It's interesting, uh, you know, in my, what I see is, and this is just my behavioral lens is that you're an order, what I would call an auditory learner yeah. and, and you learn from conversations and it's, and, and I know that because my own journey uh, with human behavior as an entrepreneur solving problems Mm -hmm. that's how I learn. I realized I'd learn from discussions. I like to read something. Then I have a conversation that connects all the dots. Usually a problem gets yeah. solved for somebody in the middle of it. I don't know where it's coming from. Right. Yes. There's my instincts. There's my experiences are all just suddenly it flies out of my mouth, but somehow I've left something impactful for the person behind yeah. um, that wasn't, that didn't come from research, but it's usually a discussion. Right. Yeah. Triggers everything. The fact I'm doing human behavior as my career and my life now came from a, a discussion. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say that's, I don't know whether that's impulsiveness um, or not. Well, the solutions definitely come out impulsively. That's what the, the reference is to, but again, it all depends on definition of impulsive. Um, because a lot of times what I'm doing is I impulsively speak out and then by the time I'm done talking, there's a solution out. So it's not like I go, hmm, let me think about this. It's just all of a sudden, boom, it's out there. And I don't put a lot of pre-thought into it because even at the time, I, a lot of times I come when I'm done speaking, I'm like, oh, that was a good idea. Well, that was a good solution. I didn't know where it came from. Yeah, I certainly think that uh, being a instinctive uh, visionary uh, thinker, you know, a, a, a person that's able to uh, brainstorm with people, mm -hmm. connect the dots, uh, I think absolutely are there. Uh, is it impulsive? Maybe in my eyes, maybe if you if you jump off ledges with it, but you know, in a way, you're a trailblazer as well, and you're helping others. Yeah, thank you. With 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 that, I I, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, just to go back with the audible discussion, like with the ADHD brain, we have a challenge with processing things internally. So we actually have to talk it out. Yeah. So we can hear it through our ears and also everything makes sense. So that's also part of the process of the talking out loud. And I tell a lot of people to talk out loud because now my brain's hearing it almost for the first time, but in a different way. But do you find your own problems get solved when you start having a conversation with someone, yes. whether it's me or yep. you talk with a colleague and you haven't been able to put together everything and suddenly you start you actually just start saying it? Yeah, and boom, impulsively shows up. Like that's the way I kind of refer it to. It's just like, boom, oh, dumb, dumb. You know, I've been thinking about it for four months, but then being it talking out loud and just a lot of times people don't have to talk back or have an opinion. It's just me talking it out to hear it again seems to connect a lot of dots as well. And how do you see this comes out in, in the tactical breakthroughs uh, business? Um, well, I got like, I got the ADC transformation journey program where we work uh, with clients, high achieving ADHD entrepreneurs, um, understand how their brain works, how to manage their symptoms so that they become strengths. And then, also concentrate on the non-ADHD talents and strengths. And then you got some online learning, but we got group sessions where we just discuss challenges and discussions. And I just tie their dots for them. Either that's an ADHD thing or that's a Colby thing, or that's maybe, you know, that's your affective or ego in the way. Yeah. Or usually what happens is we're using someone else's measuring stick. You're not measuring your talents against yourself or your output to yourself. That's someone else's stick you're using. So I'm trying to get that out of the people's way and have their own measuring stick. Yeah. So a measurement for their own life that's right. not comparing themselves to somebody else or how much money they've got. Um, or yeah. just how I should be doing stuff, right? Every time I start following the rules of the books in my business, I always start having problems. But when I threw the book out the window and just did what seemed to be right to me, like I learned from all these books. Yeah. But if it didn't make sense to me, I didn't follow them. I would take one or two bits and then create my own system that like 
my da financial dashboard, my account still gives me a hard time about it. Every other finance people are saying, how can you just look at those numbers and make sense of your stuff? So when I look at the numbers you're telling me I'm supposed to, it makes no sense to me. But if I got these, 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 these dials, I know if I'm going to have problems in six months or two weeks, I got my own early warning and just, just if it works for you, do it. It doesn't matter what everyone else is saying it should be. If it works for you, do it because we all see things uniquely and differently. Yeah, and also stress gets caused, I think, when you start you start comparing yourself to other people yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and and what they're doing. And I think that's the, uh, um, the big problem with comp comparing yourself to others. I, I, I think it doesn't hurt to learn from what they're doing. Correct. And put that into your mixing pot, but then it's it, it it's got to come out uh, unique. And no two sets of situations are the same. People develop differently. Opportunities come at different times. Um, yeah, and the other thing too is we're first of all we're oddballs because we're entrepreneurs. All right. If you want to throw in ADHD and autism, even more oddball there. We're making money. Society doesn't like entrepreneurs making money, even though they require us and they need it. So we keep fighting the system no matter what. And to be told that the way you're doing things, the way you're thinking, the way you do things is natural for you. And that's what people need you for, even though they say they don't like it. But that's what they need you for. It's just, you know, keep it up. Keep up the good world. We need the people to be thinking off the cuff and not caring about the repercussions. That's why you have certain team members to do it. Um, and just... You know, we're fighting society as entrepreneurs, as anyone who's different that doesn't follow the norm. And I'm a nonconformist, and I'll only conform if it makes sense for me and for everyone. But just because everyone wants to jump off a cliff doesn't mean I have to, too. And that's what I want people to understand is what makes you unique? And let's make better use of that. And you know what, Hugh? You're really great at all this stuff. You're probably going to get heat from people, but you know what? Maybe you're in the wrong room. Let's look for another room, different clients, different team members, family, even or friends. You're sending a lot of goosebumps down, down my spine right now, because I think I've always had to, I've had to struggle with this is to, you know, going away from being an, an accountant. And then I became a wealth manager Mm -hmm. No one could understand why am I going into the other side of the world from Sydney to Atlanta right. pursuing a human behavior uh, career. And, and you know, I, I realized that I suppose in, in the strategic coach, Dan Sullivan type terms, uh, not that I've been in the program, but I understand what it is. This was where my unique gift was. This is where I can be 10 out of 10 and particularly helping people with financial behavior. Yeah. Uh, and seeing the realities of that, uh, you know, it took me on that path. It couldn't be explained. But sometimes things, I think, to make quantum leaps in life, which is something that I've sort of yeah. centered on, that it's not linear and you can't explain it. But it's sitting there and if you're prepared to, it got the courage to have a go. Right. You can make that quantum leap, but you've probably got to be thinking about the world differently yourself differently you've got to see the world differently and yourself differently and how you fit in right and and be prepared to you know like i think my best friends have always have accepted that that's me and what i've done mm -hmm. um my family but you yourself have to to go through that mental barrier stigmas of, okay what are people going to think when in a way when what you're saying is which is what i had to do is well, it doesn't matter what they think. It's about you and your journey. Right. Exactly. On. Yeah. Like for me, the high achieving part, even then you can have a bunch of entrepreneurs, but the high achieving ambitious entrepreneurs, are even another step up. And that's another community that's hard to find. So now I've actually accepted, I'm not going to have any local friends per se. that are within that mindset. Yeah. And that's okay. It's not like I dismiss everyone. It's just, you know what? I got friends all over the globe now that I consider friends, and that's just the way it's going to be. And you know, it's like you said, like your financial DNA. I think you, if I recall, this is how it works. But you can actually trace it back to past stories, self-limiting beliefs. It all comes from the past. 
Yes. And that's what I'm really learning is with these tools and the way I've seen and perceive things and simplify stuff is just, this is all old stuff. Let's work about now and let's get that old story rejig re because this is who you truly are, not what you believe to be based on other people's stories. Yeah, I think you have to accept some of the past that you have and 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 where some of this came from, accept it. Yeah. I love it, appreciate it, and then move on. Um, you know, and take ownership of the past. It's like everyone says, like, you know, if you would have do you think if you would be in a better place if you were diagnosed earlier? Possibly, maybe. If I had a different upbringing, possibly, maybe. But I've learned from all that. I've forgiven everyone in the past. But I think I'm here to help different people. And if I didn't have that experience, I wouldn't be able to be doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. And based on what I've learned and observed, I'm sharing that. And if it can be beneficial to people, awesome. Um, but I don't completely regret it's made me who I am today, and I'm proud of that. And what can I do to my kids so that they can go through hardship and adversity, but with better tools and scenarios than I have? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, agree. I, I totally agree with that, Andre. And I think that's where, you know, you and I connect. And, you know, sort of the way I've been thinking about some of this is, is, as I've been listening to you today is, you know, I really see you as a as a disruptive thinker in 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 oh. in a in a way of not just your own life where you've continually peeled back the layers of the onion in a way and disrupted your own life and got yourself forward. And there's mm -hmm. like me, I think that we still both got many steps to go because this this book's only well, part way being written. Constant um, refinement. Yeah, but but I think you're also getting others to uh, uh, disrupt their own life and 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 look around at, at who they are uh, behaviorally, but also what they're doing, and 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 potentially going and doing something different. I like that. I disrupt people's thinking of themselves. Yeah, and that's how I uh, uh, have been hearing it today. So. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying don't, 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 um, don't think you're not the impulsive thinker because I think in your language you are that. Mm -hmm. But it is also leading people to that that quick mind that you have, it, and connecting the dots and creativity is getting people to disrupt, yeah, their own thinking about themselves. And and it might be, you know, it might be sort of the interesting question that sits here might be, is how do you want to be remembered by others? Because I think this is a big part of identity is it's not just the purpose and the value sets, but it's how you want to be seen in the world and how do you want to show up and be accountable to that? Because I think that's the higher place of being, not just doing that, then will drive future decisions. Right. Yeah. And so maybe, you know, as we sort of uh, wrap this up, you know, how, so from that perspective of your identity, how do you, how do you want to be seen? I actually had someone ask me that the other day. It was almost as if um, the, the question was actually, if you were going to make a movie about your life, what would be the title of it? Yeah. And right away it popped in as, the misunderstood challenger. Um, and yeah, cause I'm disrupting people's thinking of themselves. And, you know, I've always kind of had the sense of, I keep people off balance a little bit, almost purposefully because life is not comfortable. Um, so keeping people off balance a little bit to me, I'm doing them a favor because you can deal with some adversity and differences. And if we can do it in a setting that's safe and not high risk and then when you get in those situations it's kind of like a little bit of initiating risk or uh training um but yeah i i see myself yeah a disrupt your thinking of yourself is a big one and what i want to be remembered for is that someone simply asked me a couple of questions and completely changed the course of my life change the course of their your life. own life but also theirs theirs yeah 
do you see yourself as a what if I what have I said you saw yourself as a disruptive challenger? Yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't follow the natural course of the way things are done. Because in a way it doesn't have to be understood, right? No. In, 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 in that rational sense uh, of getting all the data and uh, where did it come from? The fact is it is. And and that's so so to me, you being the disruptive challenger fits very well with the, the objective thinking, um, being, you know, direct about it, confronting, logical in some ways, you know, because I think it, there's no lack of logic in it. You, you, it's not. No, there's no logic. Because I think impulsiveness can come from emotion. I think that the it's the disruptive challenger. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to, in my mind, it doesn't have to be understood. Um, no, it doesn't because it doesn't follow logic that because since people don't understand it, there's no logic to it. And the one thing I do have an ability of is, like I say, I challenge people if they want to be. But at the same time, I see the unique person. I see their nat natural talents and strengths. Even though they don't see it, I see it. And I want to try and bring that out in people. And, and, I think and that's that where it gets dis discomfortable for people is because. They don't quite understand what I see, but it makes sense somewhere at a subconscious level. And so, it, you know, it is very objective what you're doing. And, and you know, let's, let's sort of for the for the listener here who might listen to this. It's not without data because you are, you know, through the discovery processes you get people mm -hmm. to do, whether it's uh, Colby Strengths Finder or maybe even at some point DNA or whatever tools you use, you look at numbers, you, you're looking at a range of things. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of experience. data gathering going on, but but right. how you've got to the conclusion. That's, that's all based you. on experience and observation for over a long period of time. And, and that's what makes you an expert, right? Yeah. And, and, and of course, that's where the tactical breakthrough ultimately comes. Um, because you can help somebody turn it into tactics. But mm -hmm. the key thing is, is the disruptive, uh, uh, you know, challenging um, for, of the person's being, what they're doing. Yeah. That's the key thing. Uh, and in a way, I like to do that in terms of helping people make a quantum leap, you know, run them through a battery of uh, processes, discovery, questions, mm -hmm. to start to own the fact uh, uh, why they might need to make a change. And this is where where to make that change. Because um, I, I think a bellwether for a lot of the time of the problems is is actually your health. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you, it, you're not aligned and there is a problem if if you're feeling stressed somewhere. Uh, yeah, and that's why mental health is a big thing for me and then promoting that and having the discussions, um, you know, especially with men. And in the entrepreneurial yep. world is, you know, it is what it is, but it's, you know, I tell people take care of your mental health first, your physical health will follow. Nothing else, you know, and even listening to a guy called Peter Atia the other day, and I don't know whether you know Peter, um, he, he's a longevity expert, but he sort of said, because somebody said, well, where do you start with your longevity planning? And he said, well, it's a given, you've got to have your mental health sorted out first. Yeah. Um, and then then you can deal with the physical health, the eating and things. And, you know, and I've done a lot of work on that. I, I, I think at the end of the day, they've all got to be worked on. But because I think if you go and do some physical work, it can help the mental health and, and, and calming you down there. But there's no doubt if you don't get your mental space right, it's hard yeah. to do pretty much anything else. Physical work will help. But in the end, you still got to do the work because what I really learned over the last few years is if if you got mental health conditions, um, your brain's working overtime to deal with that and to protect you from those uh, stories or the past trauma or whatever. So your brain's not able to fully function and pay attention to your body 100%. So that's why yeah. I say if you you know, take care of your mental health so your brain can take care of the whole system effectively, not be tied up in the head trying to protect you because that's what it does. Your your adaptations, your maladaptive strategies are all your brain's way to protect you, to keep you safe. And it's what you believe to be afraid of, but may not be real. 
So your brain right. really does that and it does not work your whole system properly. No, and there's a something we might talk about another day is your heart yeah. and the role of your heart. Yeah, yeah. The heart's got a big the heart's got a bigger brain than your actual brain. <laughs> yeah. And the signals where and, and the, the amount of signals going up from your heart. It, it's it's amazing how uh all of these things at the end of the day have got to be synced up. Yeah. Um, Perfect. And and that's important if we're going to disrupt someone's life because the place that they might have to make the change is not in the area they think they're going to make the change. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So as we wrap up, Andre, is there any any tip you'd like to give our listeners, a book, a thought, anything that you'd just like to shoot out there to well, disrupt their to dis help them start disrupting their life? <laughs> well, the books could be an endless stream. Um Actually, but The Myth to Normal by Gabor Mate, that was a big influence on me over the last uh, four or five months. Um, that's just all has to do with trauma um, and how that affects mental health and yep. how society is actually causing a lot of these problems. And it was very, you know, in a way, it was very validating that the way I've been thinking and seeing things is true. Um, but honestly, the podcast, The Impulsive Thinker, yes, is for the high achieving ADHD entrepreneur. But I get a lot of people listening who are not ADHD so they can learn more about ADHD people they know or actually non-ADHD entrepreneurs learning more about their businesses. But a lot of it has to do with self-development and self-awareness. Uh, so there's a lot yeah. of different things there. Um, I'm believing I got a lot more value because I'm starting to listen to a lot of the feedback that I'm getting. And, uh, and that's a good one because all I want is people to be unique. And be allowed to be unique. Develop your vocabulary vocabulary of yourself so you can convince, or not convince, but to communicate your value to others and to figure out your game. So be your game and play your game. That's pretty much what I got to say. Yeah, I think, you know, I think just as we wrap up, and I, I, I thank you for, for, for saying all of that. And I, I think absolutely, you know, every entrepreneur needs to, sort of celebrate their uniqueness and for many of us that's why we're out there doing something yeah like entrepreneurship because we are unique we're on the edge in some way uh, but you know it's okay and i think the other part is we said earlier today don't compare yourself to anybody else just go and be you yeah your own measuring stick and remember there's a lot more like us out there it's just not next door yeah and we and and we need to liberate them yeah. Well, thank you, Andre. It's been uh, fantastic uh, talking with you today. Well, thank you, Hugh. I learned a few more things about myself, so I appreciate that. Good.